Okay, uh, going to our guest, uh, he really doesn't need much of an introduction. They've made uh, big award-winning Hollywood films about him. Uh, Al Pacino played him. Uh, Frank uh, Serpico uh, is our guest for the next 30 minutes. He's a retired New York City police detective, author, lecturer, and uh, policing expert. And he was born in 1936 in Brooklyn, New York. And he joins us now. I think it's uh, probably uh, best if uh, Frank uh, pretty much tells you about himself because I couldn't do justice to it. Uh, Frank, thank you for coming on with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, so much is going on. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, we talked to you earlier, uh, and you know, you talked about basically, you know, introducing yourself. So, Frank Serpico, uh, who are you? What do you stand for? Well, uh, first of all, I want to make a disclaimer. You know, I, I don't support any party and. I'm not running for any public office. <laughs> and I'm old enough to remember the Liberty Dime. Remember when it was made out of silver? Yes. And our dollar, our dollar notes were silver certificates. We could exchange them for silver. And now the paper they're written on, uh, it's not worth it. You remember that? Yes, I do. All right. Well, on September 11, 1959... Uh, I joined the police force in New York City and found out there was widespread corruption. I was working in uniform, and I just noticed that, um, that some officers were shaking down motorists. Now, I want to say at the onset, there are lots of honest cops out there. The only problem is, even today, when they want to report corruption, nobody wants to hear about it. And they downgrade statistics so they can tell you that, you know, the crime rate is down. Then I went undercover, and I found out they weren't only shaking down motorists, they were shaking down drug dealers. My superiors were not interested because most were getting theirs off the top. So I went to the New York Times, and on February 1st, 1971, I was shot point blank in the head on a drug raid uh, where I had a police officer back up not more than five feet away and even though I had a bullet in my head I was able to return fire and uh, hit the suspect but they let him get away out the back window and um, the movie uh, gives a wrong impression that uh, Pacino couldn't get his gun in the door that was a 9 millimeter. I was the first cop in New York City to carry one. It took them 25 years to catch up. I had a 38 special. I practically had it in the dealer's stomach uh, because I hit the door with the chain and I uh, put my arm in there and he was pushing from the back and I turned to say, what the hell are you waiting for? Give me a hand. And when I turned back, he fired point blank, hit me in the head. And fortunately... His gun jammed. He had an automatic. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you today. And then uh, they had the movie came out, and um, uh, I was retired uh, first on a, a disability pension, which gave me freedom to travel the world, which I did. And one of the first things I did uh, on my agent's uh, suggestion was to go first class to Europe. Now... I never did anything first class in my in my life. My both my grandfathers were coal miners, and um, we were poor, and and that's why I'm sick of the, the airways today. They're talking about the starving kids. I'd like to know what they're doing with the money they're giving them instead of the crap that they're eating and not eating whole food. Food they're eating uh, junk food, but that's another issue. So traveling first class. People didn't believe that a guy dressed like me could be first class. <laughs> and they kept telling me to go back to your class. And uh, I said, uh, what class is that? And they said, tourist, steerage. And I said, listen, you may think I'm wrong in steerage, but you don't have any class at all. <laughs> and, and then the captain found out that, oh, I was Serpico. And he invited me to his table, but I graciously declined. I already saw what the upper class was all about, you know? Absolutely.
absolutely I spending all that. Walking around. When I was a kid, I had patches on my pants. The only patches you see on pants today is when people pay extra money to pretend that they're poor. And the difference between what happened in the Depression and what's happening now is back then, before the Depression, poor people weren't wearing designer jeans and sneakers. So when they get hit now, they're not going to know what hit them because they don't know what poor is. Frank. So I lived abroad for 10 years. I was actually living in Switzerland for a year and a half where I might have still been there, as the movie says. But I was graciously run out by no other than our FBI, where I started getting my first impressions about what the FBI does. Uh, they wanted me to come back to New York. I was actually pursued through the snow with my dog and my clothes under my hand, and I fled to Germany, where I bought a camper trailer, a small Volkswagen bus, and I traveled throughout Europe. And, uh, and I found a spot in Holland, and from there, my base, uh, I traveled all over the world. I, and then before that, I'd been uh, to Asia, the East, and Russia. And when I got back to the States, I figured I saw more of the world than I did of the United States. So I bought myself another little camper, and I traveled all through the United States. And I saw how the, the real people live, the workers and the farmers, the people that put food on our table, and the rich people that abused them and wouldn't know how the hell to cook a, how to, how to grow a potato, and yet they want to look down on the working class. Frank Serpico is our guest, and his handset broke, so he's joining us via speakerphone uh, for listeners out there. Uh, Frank Serpico, of course, the legendary New York City detective, who wouldn't go on the take, and uh, thanks to his work, uh, much of that corruption did end up coming out. You know, sir, uh, when I was uh, going over your uh, blog, uh, your website, frankserpico.com, I, I, I saw a lot of your comments about Fast and Furious, the, the ATF caught shipping guns into Mexico. I saw your comments about, yes, bin Laden is dead, or is he? I mean, I am... I, I, uh, my, one of my producers talking to you said you were bringing up globalism. What is your view on the big banking cartels like Wells Fargo and Wachovia last year that got caught in two years laundering $376 billion uh, of narcotics money and actually owning and leasing and running the drug aircraft themselves and the fact that they didn't get any trouble? What's your view on the drug war? Because from my research, it's like alcohol prohibition. It's exactly. all been... Now, again, I'd like to back up a little because everybody knows uh, Mayor Giuliani, right? Yes. And in 9-11, the biggest crime scene in the world, in world history, Giuliani uh, had it cleaned up um, and uh, shipped uh, uh, wherever he sent uh, the metal to. He was knighted by England and he appoints his driver, Bernie Carrick. Um, you know, they formed uh, their own uh, law firm uh, which is, I think, uh, called the, the uh, Giuliani Associates, uh, Giuliani Partners. Yes. Right? And he had a, quite a few assorted characters on there. One of them, Bernie Carrick, who later got indicted. Uh, another guy, the Morrow, former assistant director in charge of the FBI in New York's office, and the inspector in charge following 9-11. Um, how's my reception? It's, it's great, Mr. Serpico. Bottom line, are you saying the 9-11 official story stinks? It certainly does. But if I can go on, uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of his team uh, from Giuliani Partners, uh, who was the inspector in charge following 9-11, admitted taking six artifacts from Ground Zero as memoirs, and no action was ever taken by the FBI. Um, and then he had another character, uh, 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 Mr. Alan Placa, accused of molesting, um, oh no, that's Monsignor, Monsignor Alan Placa, accused of molesting numerous children and covering up molestation in the church, another one of his uh, partners. Um, and, and then the firm said that Giuliani believed
believes that Alan Parker was unjustly accused and the firm has no plans to dismiss him. And then another one of his uh, clients, an admitted drug smuggler and millionaire founder of companies that perform electronic information, and it just goes on and on. And then uh, Mr. Giuliani with his firm goes to Mexico. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, and I understand as a detective, you're giving us some background and some of those unsorted uh, players that are involved. But bottom line, why are you saying 9-11, the, the attacks themselves? You're saying that, that stinks? You have questions about? Well, I, it says, first of all, we all know that they could have prevented it if they would have listened. Uh, you know, uh, I'm in touch with a lot of, I don't like the term whistleblowers. I like to call them lamp lighters. You know, federal agents... Uh, you know, we have the, the the equipment to prevent anything. We could be the safest country in the world. The problem is we have incompetence at the top. And as you say, who knows what deals they're making with the World Bank. And um, I, I don't want to get into that because I don't want to implicate other people. But well, I'm let me ask you this. What do you think about, line. Frank, what do you think about Building 7 falling in? On ah, that's a good point. Because Mr. Giuliani opened up his uh, his command center there, and um, he stored uh, lots of um, fuel there. Uh, uh, um, and uh, his uh, director of emergency management, I think his name was Jerome Hoare, H-A-U-E-R, I think, he advised uh, Giuliani not to store it there because it was vulnerable uh, due to the previous uh, attack on the World Center. Giuliani overruled him. And then he puts out erroneous information saying that he followed uh, his director's advice. And um, another thing, it, it's not only what happened, but in the aftermath or how it happened. I don't know if your audience knows that before 9-11, uh, it was found that the radio transmitters were old and inoperable. They, they were deficient. So uh, what happened, they made a deal. Uh, it was um, uh, what they call, um, uh, they, they made a deal with Motorola in a no-bid contract, right? Sure, the radios didn't work right. Right, $33 million. And they were implemented early 2001, and they were recalled in March 2001 because a probationary firefighter called for help at a house fire, and he couldn't, couldn't be picked up by others at the scene. So the problem is there were 343 um, uh, firefighters that, uh, when their chief told them to evacuate the building, they couldn't be heard. And Giuliani said, no, that was just, they didn't want to leave. They wanted to do their job and save people. So what I'm saying is, I guess what was said well by um, Peter Stuyvesant, well, the character that played Peter Stuyvesant in Knickerbocker Holiday, was the, Peter Stuyvesant was the first governor of New York, um, he said, governments, one and all, are case of the nature of rackets. They become partners in crime and ultimately annihilate the civilization over which they preside. And I couldn't agree more fully than that. Frank Serpico, legendary New York detective who exposed uh, the fact that the city itself, uh, the establishment was basically skimming off the top of the drug trade. Uh, Frank, we've seen CIA hearings in Congress in the late 90s admitting government drug dealing, crack cocaine. We've seen the Pulitzer Prize winning work of uh, Gary Webb, who then was shot twice in the head and they ruled it suicide. Uh, we've seen um, the uh, CIA aircraft full of cocaine crashing in Mexico. Now we have Wells Fargo, uh, and this is in Bloomberg AP, you name it for new listeners, laundering hundreds of billions of dollars of drug money, being caught and not getting in trouble, 
paying, what, a hundred and something million dollar fine on hundreds of billions uh, in profit. Uh, from your deep research and living it for decades, how does the drug trade really operate? I mean, now over in Afghanistan, they have Fox News and ABC News going, oh, yes, the Marines and Army help grow the opium. And then we don't worry about where it goes after that. But if we catch your kid with it, we're going to put him in jail. I mean, isn't the drug war about having it illegal to keep the price up? Uh, I was in a uh, documentary that uh, aired in um, Amsterdam in uh, the Netherlands, and it's uh, called The Drug War's Damage Done. And I was proud to be on with a bunch of professional former military and uh, drug enforcement officers that say it's a lost cause, uh, drug, uh, uh, drugs should be legalized, they should be controlled, and, um, you know, not believing that because they legalize it, everybody's going to go out and, uh, and, and use drugs. It's, it's like alcohol. You have alcoholics that you can't talk logically to them um, uh, because they are, uh, they are addicted to alcohol. It's the same with some that get addicted to narcotics. These are health issues. They're not criminal issues. That's the way uh, they should be handled. Uh, uh, they have AA for alcoholics, does wonderful work. They have um, NA, not, uh, Narcotics Anonymous. These are social issues. But the problem is who, uh, there's too much money being made with the prison industry that they have more people in jail than any other nation in the world. And um, I don't know what, what American people are waiting for. I, I guess that's why they want to take their guns away uh, so that then they can have total control. Well, that was my next question. I know you've, according to your blog, had some concerns about Fast and Furious. Obviously, it's now been confirmed by the El Paso Times, Chicago Tribune, uh, in the federal documents that have come out that the Sinaloa drug cartel for at least five years has been working for the CIA, FBI, DEA, uh, and ATF to knock out the other cartels that are not laundering their money through the proper banks and that, that the whole thing in Mexico is about big banks using the U.S. government and certain cartels to knock out their competition and consolidate that $500 billion a year uh, industry. Uh, and, and, and on the other issue, then blame the Second Amendment uh, for crime in Mexico. And now, even though the Attorney General has been caught perjuring himself to Congress, he's been caught lying about ordering it. He did indeed order it. Uh, nobody's getting in trouble, and, and, and they're going ahead with trying to push more gun control uh, in the name of uh, stopping guns the U.S. government allowed to be shipped in. Uh, Serpico, what would you call that? I would call that uh, government suppression or uh, uh, government control or police. Uh, you know, the thing is, you have guys that serve, they know how to use the guns, and then they come back and they take them away from them. They're the very guys that should be, uh, you know, able to keep their weapons to defend themselves and to defend the democracy that they fought for. Um, but unfortunately, they say you can't fight City Hall. You know, nothing changes. The French say, plus que se change, the plus que reste la même. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And then they want to say that, oh, things are improving. Well, things are, are, are not improving because in my day, uh, you know, uh, when the dealers were paying off, I would catch a guy. And he would say, how come you're not walking up that guy? I said, which guy? And, uh, and he says, you're locking me up because I'm not paying off. And I said, no. I said, I'll lock up anybody. If you're violating the law, I'll lock you up. So he said, would you lock up so-and-so? Um, well, well, he referred to him as Whitey. I said, try me. And uh, he gave me the information. I locked him up. And then uh, I come in and I find out the guy... Um, uh, you know, kill the police officer, and I come in, and the, the other cops and the police are having coffee with the guy. So, you know, they tell you there's this, uh, this, this allegiance and stuff. Let me just point it in one way. Uh, in my case, they were talking about taking me out, and one guy said, we're talking about another cop. And the response they got was, 
we're talking about our money. And the problem is the greed that these corporations have, and then they control the masses by telling them that they have to live in a certain lifestyle, otherwise they have no significance. And it's very unfortunate that we don't have the right teachers that teach children their own value as a human being, and they have just as much as anybody else with no matter how many titles he has or alphabet soup after their name. Uh, I have more respect for the man that empties my septic tank and the farmer that puts, puts food on my table than these politicians. I have this saying that politics comes from the uh, Greek root poly, meaning many, and ticks, which is a blood-sucking parasite. <laughs> many ticks, yes. Uh, Frank Serbico, legendary New York detective who stood up and exposed corruption and was grievously wounded in the process. Um, bottom line, though, here, um, the big banks launder the money, the Marines and Army grow the opium um, in every major city. They either have a police chief that turns a blind eye or lives in a million-dollar house. Uh, I've grown up. I've been, you know, in college to friends' houses whose dad's an FBI agent, and it's a $3 million house. I grew up in Rockwall, Texas, and the police dealt drugs, and it was well-known. And then they'd come give D.A.R.E. programs to the kids, actually teaching them how to use it. I mean, you can, Hollywood glamorizes it. I mean, it's a whole sales job, and they keep the drugs illegal to uh, keep the prices up and to pack our prisons uh, full of people to work for slave wages, displacing everybody else's wages. Do you agree, Frank Serpico, with that statement? Um, I find it hard to disagree. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I believe that public service should be exactly that, public service. Uh, and you don't join the police or the FBI or the CIA to, to get rich. It's supposed to be a public service. And it's the same for the, 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 uh, the politicians. It, they, they look like two cats fighting each other, and uh, instead of talking the good of the country, they're talking about the good of their party, and it, it gets us nowhere. Um, what percentage of the New York uh, detectives when you worked there, I've seen numbers as high as 75%, what percentage were on the take? Well, in, in my, I can't speak for the whole department, but in, in my unit, it was pretty much they were all on the take. Now, here's the problem, Alex. The system is made to fail, okay? Uh, uh, when I was a cop, they had the expression about corruption, the grass eaters and the meat eaters, right? So the grass eaters were referred to the guys that only took uh, so-called clean money. See, that was traffic money or uh, gambling money or vice money. And then, and this is how I got into uh, that agency, because they told me it was the only way I could advance, and everybody knew that agency was corrupt. And they said to me, there's a new department directive. Unless you do four years in plain clothes, nobody goes into the detective division. So here's what happened. Four years, these officers get used to grazing. Okay? It was like, yeah, I'm talking about in the 60s, uh, there was, in my unit, you got $800 a month clean, no questions asked, no tax. Uh, and plus anything you can make on the side, any score that you can make. Then uh, these guys are renting yachts and, uh, and custom-made suits, uh, burning their, uh, their illegal money uh, on, uh, uh, you know, uh, extra apartments, buying houses, buying land all over the country. And then they assign them to narcotics. Now, after grazing for four years, you think all of a sudden they're going to see the light and all of a sudden drug money... Frank Serpico, we're back in one minute. Do, uh, do one more segment with us, okay? Uh, Frank Serpico, legendary New York detective. Yeah, that's that's how it works, folks. And, and, and now you look at most police out there, a lot of them, they look like gangsters. By the way, talking to Frank Serpico uh, during that short little break, a legendary New York detective, website frankserpico.com. I said, so, uh, your, your handset's broken. You're on a speakerphone.
And he said, yeah, well, there's really not much need to, you know, have a, you know, a handheld because I don't really do any interviews. And I said, well, how long has it been since you've done an interview? And he said, years. So this is uh, quite the interview uh, here that it's been years since he's done a uh, radio interview. Frank Serpico. Frank. Uh, uh, Alex, let me say, the last one I did was a call-in show. Yes. And this uh, guy called in. He said, yeah, hi, um, I'm living in Florida. I'm a retired New York City police officer. I said, hey, how you doing? He says, you know, Frank, the day you testified before the NAP Commission was the darkest day of the history of the New York City Police Department. I said, really? He said, yeah. I was ashamed to go home and face my wife and kids. I said, really? I said, why? What did you do wrong? He said, nothing. I said, well, why didn't you support me? And he said, what? And be an outcast like you? And that's what it's all about. That's why they don't want whistleblowers they don't want you to ruin a good business. And once the corruption builds, then no one will go after anybody, even for worse and worse crimes, and then the whole society collapses. And Frank Serpico, I believe we're nearing that third world collapse point. What do you say? I, uh, I'm inclined to agree. But again, Alex, I want to say, because I know a lot of decent police officers out there that are trying to do their job, but meeting resistance. And let me just tell you, on a local incident, uh, uh, there was my friend was um, uh, being um, um, accosted, and it was very uh, uh, serious circumstances. And I called the police, and they did a lousy follow-up. And then there was a series of rapes, and I called the hotline that they said, if you know anything, call this number. And I thought, oh. Maybe if they follow up on this lead, maybe they'll find. They never call me back on a hotline. And Sir, all the police do around here half the time is they're told. I've talked to them. They go write tickets and raise revenue. And more and more, you saw in Oakland last year, he said 35 crimes we won't respond to, including breaking and entering, robbery. I mean, they're not. They're there now more and more to literally just write tickets. But that's what they're being told to do. Well, they should rebel. They're well, that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, thing, but it, here's what happens. You know, and it's an old thing, too. You know, in the department, it's not black or white. It's blue. That's what happened um, in, um, after Katrina. You remember the cat uh, catastrophe there with them shooting uh, unarmed civilians? And, and the cops running around robbing Walmart. Yeah. And the uh, same thing happened uh, at 9-11. Some of the firemen were filling their fire trucks with, with, uh, with clothes. And, well, and Rolexes. Whole, like you say, the society has to be revamped. We have no more, you know, morality has been going down, downhill. Uh, um, anyway, we... Well, here's the problem, leaders. Frank. We think that our government should be our leaders, but they're not. They're part of the problem. Well, Frank, I mean, the, 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 you're absolutely right, but the big issue here is the government is running out of rackets and they want more, more, more. So now they're taking people's kids if they spank them or the, or the parents have dirty plates in the sink. And then, and then the state's five times more likely to abuse the child than the parents. Frank Serpico, I've got a few final questions for you. I didn't know you hadn't done interviews in years. Great job of the producers uh, getting you here on the show, and we appreciate you coming on. I've got a few other questions from your blog I want to cover and see, uh, see if there's any other points you'd like to impart to our large audience, frankserpico.com. Hope we don't crash your website here today. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com. We'll spend a few more minutes with Frank Serpico straight ahead. Bob Chapman's coming up. Stay with us. Federal Reserve running right the country. Stealing tens of trillions of dollars in bailout money. You've got major banks caught laundering hundreds of millions of dollars of drug money like Wells Fargo and others. They don't even get in trouble. Uh, and it's in the news. They've taken all the military's death benefits from World War II vets right through. I made a secret deal with the government. That's mainstream news. I mean, the lawlessness has gotten right out in the open. And Frank Serpico, the legendary New York City police detective uh, who stood up and, uh, and exposed the corruption, probably one of the most famous whistleblowers 
worldwide. Uh, you know, big uh, award-winning films with Al Pacino made about it, best-selling books. I wanted to, in closing, and, and Bob Chapman's waiting in the wings on the financial news, uh, ask him what he's up to these days. I know you're uh, you're still very involved lecturing. You said you haven't done radio in a very long time or done interviews, but you are lecturing and, and you're also working uh, out there to try to educate people about police corruption. Yeah, well, my bottom line is we're chasing phantoms around the world while ignoring the monsters in our own backyard. And I think we have to get back to the family. Um, you know, mothers have to realize what a great honor and responsibility it is to be a mother and, and uh, teach our children how to live healthily. We should stay away from all the junk foods that these corporations are selling us. And, um, uh, you know, support lo the local economy. Uh, that's how we, that's what America was built on, local economy, uh, not these um, uh, uh, outsourcing uh, conglomerates. You know, they're closing down the little farms. The food was good. The meat was good. The eggs were good. They came out with all these government regulations. Uh, we got too much government control. You know, we're just a simple example, you have to wash the eggs. When the, I, I have my chickens and eggs, and the eggs stay fresher when they're not washed because the chicken puts, uh, coats it with an antibacterial. You wash it off, and that's where you get the salmonella from because it's all these corporations and the way they're treating the meat. And the system knows that. Now, now Frank, uh, what's your take on... Bin Laden uh, supposedly being killed after all these years, and then they keep changing the official story and claim that they threw his body into the ocean. Well, um, I think that's a good question. We could ask the commander in chief, you know, and uh, see what he has to say. I think. Uh, but uh, the only problem is, Alex, they've been lying to us for so long; they have zero credibility. Well, that's right. If you have a neighbor who you've caught lying to you five times, you stop associating with them. But government he lies even when the truth would serve them better. I mean, bottom line, as a, as a you know detective, as a researcher, as a lecturer, when you look at things like 9-11, when you look at the lies about WMDs, when you see the ridiculous bin Laden story, and we had the intel he was dead 2002, that he would be rolled out later. I mean, bottom line, what is Frank Serpico's view on the New World Order? Um... I, I think that you have to, as they say, uh, believe half of everything you hear and see. Uh, the intelligent part is which half to believe, you know. And, uh, but most importantly is uh, to believe in yourself uh, as an individual and clear your mind of all the pollution that they're feeding us 24-7. Uh, and um, you'll find... That you knew it from the day you were born what the truth is. Absolutely. Our instincts, our common sense is there, and the modern brainwashing system is there to uh, create confusion. I was just reading your blog specifically, though. Uh, you're, you're saying something smells with the whole bin Laden caper? Yeah. Well, I don't remember what I wrote on the blog back then. But, uh, yeah, of course it does. You know, the way they, they went in there and, uh, you know, where is this guy, you know? You got the body, they, they, why, why can't we see the body? Well, uh, what, they disfigured it or something? Uh, somebody's going to be in bounds? Show us the body. Show us the corpus delicti, you know? Um, but, I mean, your detective knows, uh, smells something. Of course. Uh, what about passports, not one but two, magically surviving out of the planes at ground zero and then being found later that day by the FBI? Uh, maybe they found a... Uh, uh, Lucky Charms uh, uh, elf as well. You know, in the business, that's called a flake. You know, they drop it there. You know, uh, um, like in um, in New Orleans, the, the cops talked about a ham sandwich, you know, uh, dropping a gun on the suspect that wasn't there. Uh, there I, I could tell you uh, story after story about how people have been flaked, even with the narcotics, you know, they go after the user and they put on a felony a quantity and charge them as being uh, a dealer. And, and you ask them what they're doing and they say, eh, they only scum anyway, you 
just cleaning them off the street. Uh, there's this this mentality that's become d distorted that is inhuman. Um, and um, Well, now they've run out of drug dealers to lock up. They're the drug dealers themselves while calling a drug user scum. And then you see record numbers of police on drugs. Our troops are getting on drugs. And it, it, it's just so dangerous to have the police with all this power really being in more and more major cities a mafia. I mean, sir, as you probably know, it came out just two years ago in Dallas, or now three, that they just randomly pull over a nice car, throw a bag of chalk in the back. The drug lab certifies it as cocaine. They're even taking old women's cars now with no criminal record. I mean, that is hardcore evil. But you were saying back when you were in there, they were shaking down drivers. Well, let me tell you, uh, your listeners saw the the the, uh, the, the movie uh, The French Connection. Yes. Well, all the drugs that were seized in the French Connection went back out on the street. Compliments of the NYPD. All the drugs were taken out of the property clerk's office and replaced with flour. And a clerk noticed that there were moths. Uh, you know. <laughs> And uh, moths don't eat cocaine or heroin, you know? And that's how <laughs> they found all the drugs were missing. Incredible. Frank Serpico, I know that you, uh, as you said, I haven't done a radio interview in a very long time, and this has been incredible. Uh, I'd like to get you in the next month or so back for a full hour to really just recount some of the incredible historic things uh, that uh, you have witnessed uh, in your in your lifetime, and obviously there's best-selling books written about you, movies with, with uh, Al Pacino. Um, I want to bring Bob Chapman in because he's had a very interesting past uh, as well, uh, formerly in uh, intelligence operations against the Soviets and then the largest silver and gold broker for a while until he retired, and then now he has one of the biggest newsletters out there on finances. And I want to treat Bob since he's been holding because we held you over. Hey, Bob, uh, I know it is a treat because, I mean, nobody get, hardly gets to talk to Frank Serpico. Bob Chapman, you got anything to say to uh, Mr. Serpico? Well, first, I want to congratulate you, as you have been many, many times for what you've done uh, for the people of the New York and this country. Uh, if more people would speak up like yourself, we wouldn't have the problems we've got. And uh, corruption in, uh, in law enforcement goes back for centuries. Uh, you know that. But the public doesn't realize that. Um, there's nothing new <clears throat> that's come down the line in a long time. Uh, all you have to do is look at the history of crime, and that's Wall Street as well as uh, Harlem. And, uh, and you, know, you know how to approach it and how to handle it, and you did it, and, and everybody should be proud of you. Well, uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, good luck to you. And uh, as he said, uh, you know, the uh, the quality of the good far outweighs the, the quantity of the evil that's out there. So good people just have to stick together, and uh, um, and uh, hopefully we can make a, a better world for our children. Well, Frank, uh, do you agree with my point that if you just decriminalize, not legalize, but decriminalize and take the money out of drugs, it won't be cool anymore, the kids won't want to use it, and the cops will lose their biggest source of uh, corrupt income. The banks will lose it. I mean, shouldn't we move to decriminalize drugs? But then I get scared and think, what will they come after next, though? Well, they're already trying. Vitamins, minerals, they're already raiding whole milk places. I mean, they're already sending the drug squads out now against the Amish. Yep, yep. And uh, they're, they're wonderful people, the Amish people. I visited them uh, uh, often, and I, I said... To one of the elders, I said, you know, I really admire your way of life. Uh, whose idea was it to live this way? And he said, what? He says, your grandfather was living this way. And all of a sudden I realized, because I remember when I visited my grandfather when I was a little uh, kid in Europe, it's just a simple life close to the earth and... Um, you know, respecting the ground that's feeding you. Um, and, uh, and Frank, now they're turning, I don't know if you're aware of this, you probably are, they're now using the drug police against the Amish when they sell neighbor's cheese. Oh, yeah, yeah, raw milk, and uh, it's terrible. 
But I mean, they're turning the corrupt narcotics police loose on the Amish. I mean, is there no end to this evil? There's a great book out. Everything I want to do is illegal. And he's not talking about drugs. It's written by a farmer. And how the uh, conglomerates and all the uh, government uh, is taking over everything. Well, Frank, what in closing, what do we do? I mean, if we decriminalize the drugs, that would put a, uh, that would stop a lot of this. Yes, but also we have to educate. The other thing is, why are so many people using drugs? You know, it's because you know when times get hard, uh, you know somebody, you know, you had a hard day or something, you need a drink. Uh, let me put it this way: a good buddy of mine, he's a Vietnam vet, um, decorated, wounded in action. Uh, he's highly strong, and he says to me, you know, Frank, if these cops had any sense, they'd knock on my door every morning. Hold on, hold on. And we're finishing up with Frank Serpico, incredible interview with him. And uh, during the break, uh, he was bringing up the TSA. Uh, he was bringing up a bunch of issues. I want you to finish with that, sir, uh, in a moment, but uh, go ahead and uh, get back to uh, your veteran buddy, uh, who said, hey, the cops ought to knock on my door every morning. I've, I finished that point you were making. Are uh, we on? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, my uh, buddy, uh, Vietnam vet, one of uh, several has been wounded and decorated um, and uh, likes to smoke a little weed once in a while to calm him down because when he doesn't, he's all uh, charged up. He said, if the cops were smart, they'd come and knock on my door every morning and say, here, smoke this. Yeah. And uh, the guy's a, a decent, honorable patriot, and he's got to be afraid that, you know, it's just terrible. People think that, uh, some other people told me the other day, they came out of a party uh, in New York, and they opened a can of beer on the stoop, and two plainclothes officers came across and arrested them. Oh, no, no. They're now arresting women who sit on a park bench too long. I mean, and, and I've been in New York a lot over the years, and the police are getting crazier and crazier. They now act like complete thugs, smoke cigars while they're arresting people. Uh, their bellies are hanging out. I mean, it looks like worse than third world countries I've been to, Frank. I mean, how far is this going to get? Are they going to put gold thrones out for the police now, and we'll have to lick their boots when we walk by? I don't know, I just want to say to your listeners, uh, uh, find out about uh, micronutrition, eat your greens and beans, exercise, and stay healthy. Frank, what's your final TSA point? You were uh, you raised that for me. You said you don't fly. Yeah, because uh, I don't want to submit myself uh, to what I call abuse. Um, yeah, it's amazing, you know, in the old days, I could fly with my gun to any state in the Union, and I'd say to the pilot, you're supposed to turn your gun in, and I'd say, here, he said, what do you want me to do with that? He says, I don't know how to use it. You keep it. You try, a police officer now, or, you know, respectable people try to get on with a nail file, and they're telling us that we're freer and safer now? Uh... You know, but, you know, the American people, uh, they're not stupid. Uh, they're catching on to the rhetoric and, uh, you know, uh, the different terms they're using. Uh, you know, uh, if you object to anything, you're, you're a terrorist or whatever. Um, but uh, I think uh, the time is running out. Absolutely. People are waking up. They're using the war on terror uh, to, to, to basically set up a domestic um Third World Police State or East German Stasi? Is that what you're getting at, um, Frank? Uh, yeah, pretty much so. Uh, you know, um, now that we have, well, look at what happened in England. Now they want to take the uh, the phones away from, they want to take away their civil liberties just because maybe one Yahoo or something uh, violated uh, or used it for a, a, a bad purpose. It doesn't mean everybody's bad, you know? But well, San Francisco just, just turned. Excuse to us further and further. Absolutely, uh, San Francisco just turned the cell phones off last week because of a peaceful demonstration. Cut everybody's cell phones off. Absolutely, well said. Well, Frank Serpico, I can certainly see why you stood up back in the '70s and you're standing up now. Um, I, I wish you weren't one in a million, but God bless you, and I look forward to speaking to you again uh, here on the radio. Same to you, Alex. Thank you. All right, there he goes, Frank Serpico.